Okay, so today's tutorial is all about understanding the data-driven classroom. Um, by the end of the tutorial, you'll learn how to use data in a virtual classroom, how to make a QR code link to a Google form for a quick formative assessment, and how to use Padlet for a quick formative assessment, and then finally to also think about the data team cycle. So there's a lot to get to, let's get started. So first off, when we talk about the data-driven classroom, it's important to note the verbiage that's going to be used most often. Formative assessment is basically data that is provided to help inform and guide instruction as you're going along in the unit or towards the standard that you're having the students prove mastery on. This can occur with or without technology. Sometimes when you use technology, it can definitely make this part of the process more engaging. So we're going to talk about a couple of ideas with that. Summative assessment is a basically data that's provided at the end of the unit instruction, um, and it can help guide you um, for previous previous years, or, or I mean, Summative assessment is data that's provided at the end of the unit of instruction. So while it might not guide that present day uh, unit, it will definitely help um, give you direction and guidance for teaching it the next year, for example, or what to do differently next time. So schools need to basically create a culture around data-driven discussion and reflection. It doesn't need to be scary. I know as an English teacher, I'm not really all about data, or at least that's the way I thought when it was originally brought to our district. So um, instead of scaring the pants off of people, <laughs> you need to just start creating a culture where uh, you reflect. You reflect on everything. I mean, teachers do this all the time anyways, but I think we need to do it maybe a little bit more intentionally, even if you're an English teacher. So we just need to constantly reflect on what is working for our students and what isn't. It shouldn't waste a teacher's time. In fact, it should really allow for us to save time. Um, one of the main ways I've seen this happen is by being more intentional with my formative assessment. I know when my kids are ready to take the test and when they're not. So we are a proficiency model or a mastery model. And I would say a couple of years ago, I was having to give um, an assessment more than once. I, I mean, that's definitely what the mastery model talks about. Um, but I would have to give the assessment two or even three times to make sure that all of my kids were being successful. And instead, now what I see is that I have to give the assessment one time and then I will give alternative assessments for the majority of the students and then give the assessment one more time for those that are struggling after giving some guided small group instruction to make sure all kids can be successful. But that's a definite um, savings of time for me. I'm able to move on to a new unit instead of spending yet another week or two on re-instruction re and giving the assessment again. So data should really help save time for teachers. And you should know exactly where your students are in the process of, you know, guiding them through understanding of those standards um, at all times. Formative data helps guide your instruction. You are looking at it constantly, whether you think you are or not. So we'll just talk about how to do that more intentionally. All right, so the data target. Teachers should focus on formative data. You need to identify skills that haven't been learned by students through their instruction yet. Use small group instruction to help those that are struggling. I think I, I've been talking a lot with my own personal staff constantly about personalized instruction. What does it mean? What does it look like? You're using formative data to help kids go at their own pace. And by using small group instruction, not just at the lower elementary grades, which is where I think we kind of use it the most, you're starting to see it being used much more at a secondary level, which is kind of exciting. You can have kids moving at lots of different um, pace, paces. And, you know, I've said repeatedly that this new... Um, classroom doesn't look like we always thought it did. There's no longer students sitting in neat, nice rows, being quiet, listening to the teacher at the front of the room. Um, it might look like ordered chaos, to be perfectly honest, because you've personalized the instruction to the point where you've got some kids that are moving on with extension activities and some kids that are, you know, a little bit behind and you're working on getting them where everybody else is. So uh, use the formative uh, data to help guide that process. Develop extension activities, like I said, alternative assessments for those that have demonstrated their mastery on the content. So 
I'm hoping that all kids will be successful by the time I give the first uh, assessment. And for the most part, a large majority of my students are successful. So basically what I've started to do is I will give one assessment that's common throughout the department. And then um, as I see students that are showing mastery, I, I tell the kids you have to have at least an 80% or higher to do the extension activity or to work on the alternative assessment. And this is really exciting for them because this is where they really get to be creative. And generally my alternative assessments are asking the kids to create their own content, to either teach other students or to just show what they know on, this, on the standard that we're currently working at. So 80% or higher, and then they get to go on or move on to the other activity. And then I can divide my time up with those smaller groups and work with those that are really struggling. So um, it's really fun. The kids really like it. You can give them a menu of options to prove what they understand. But formative assessments will help you in, in guiding you towards that area and figuring out when the kids are ready for their tests and when they're not. So how do you collect the data? Well, once you've finished the backwards design process for a unit, which we've talked about in the previous tutorials, then at that point you've clearly identified your objectives and skills that are needed, and then you need to figure out the best way to collect your data. So different types of formative assessments. You can use good old-fashioned hand signals. Thumbs up, thumbs down, you understand what's going on. Um, some people use that five finger on a scale of one to five, how do you feel, etc. So hand signals are always good and quick and easy. Um, exit slips are always always pretty popular. Web maps or concept maps when you say, okay, let's let's do this together and, and make, um, here's our concept, what do you know? Let's branch off from that. Sometimes you have an actual worksheet with, that you have the kids fill out for that, and sometimes it's just on a piece of paper. Student conferencing. I know with the flipped classroom for myself, my one-on-one -on -one time, my face-to-face -face time with the kids is super important, and I'm constantly having student conferences or just interacting with my students and figuring out where they're at in their, their own individual process. Think pair share is always an oldie but a goodie, and then also quick writes. So the next question is, how can some of these become digital? Well, I'm going to start with exit slips because I think a lot of people use these and I think they're pretty easy to start to um, change change up digitally. Um, so one, one way you can do this is QR codes linked to Google Forms. I have a, um, a fellow teacher in my building named Marshall, Marshall Cook. He teaches science and he came up with a brilliant way to create just a basic Google Form um, that he can go in and tweak and, and whatnot depending on his daily unit or lesson. Um, and then he's attached it to a QR code and he's actually tape that onto the student's desks. So at the end of the, the period when he's ready to find out where they're at, he just has them scanned the, the QR code and instantly answer some questions so he can get some daily feedback on how the kids are doing, which I think is brilliant. And he then taught the rest of our staff how to do that, which is exciting. We're seeing that in pop up in classrooms throughout our building. You could also use a discussion thread on an LMS. So our uh, learning management system is Schoology, and it's really easy to, to develop a discussion thread and just ask a simple prompt and have the kids respond. I use those a lot, actually. And then there's another option using a web-based board um, like Padlet where you can ask a question and the kids, you just give the link to the Padlet um, and then the kids can go on and add their own information. I've seen this used not only in classrooms but in professional development with teachers as well. So it's a great way to just get some quick feedback. So those are just a few examples and I will go through um, using Padlet and um, how to make just a quick Google form and attach it to a QR code. So you can have those for your own personal use. So, um, thinking about some other options uh, besides just exit slips. So um, things like web maps or concept maps, you can use web-based concept maps like Lucidchart. There's a couple of others, especially if you're a Google Apps for Education school. There's a couple of different um, extensions, Chrome extensions that you can use that are linked right into the Google Drive accounts for the students. So I really uh, recommend looking into that. I'm a, in a one-to-one -one iPad school, so we really love using um, the app Poplet. I think we're using just Poplet Lite. I'm not sure we've actually bought the full version for our students, but they seem to use it just fine. And it's really exciting to see how their brain works and how they map things together. So I've used Poplet a lot. I know a couple of other uh, teachers use it a lot in our building, and um, I think it's a really good one. And then as far as quick writes, I can't say enough about utilizing Google Drive during the writing process. I dive into students' um, essays constantly to see where they're at in the process, to answer any questions. 
I have found that my students are more willing to revise and edit their stuff than ever before just by using Google Drive for that writing process. Whether it's a quick write or a full essay, Google Drive and sharing those documents with um, with you know each other, whether you're doing a couple of students on a, on a document or just student to teacher, it's just huge and I can't say enough about it. So really look into that if you haven't already.